Gibson J45 is one of the most iconic guitars in history. Introduced in 1942, this guitar has seen venues from arenas all the way to bar rooms. So today we're going to talk about the Gibson J45, what makes this guitar unique, and why you should be on the lookout for one right now. So stick around. Like I mentioned earlier, the Gibson J45 was introduced in 1942. Now when World War II broke out, Gibson had to figure out some creative ways to manufacture the J45 because metals and woods were going to the war effort. So in its earliest infant years, the Gibson J45 was made of all kinds of different components. Now typically it had a spruce top and mahogany back insides like this one, but sometimes you'll see them with maple back insides. Sometimes you will see uh, all mahogany back and sides and mahogany tops. And likewise, the necks were really, really big on those early uh, J45s because they didn't have a truss rod. And I think that really plays into the folklore of the J45. If you ask J45 players, typically they'll say no two J45s are alike. And I think that this kind of harkens back to that original era of Gibson J45s. Uh, no two really were alike. They were all different. They all sounded different. Sometimes you would get great sounding ones. Sometimes you would get a dud. And so the, the legend of a J45 having its own soul and its own spirit uh, really began at its onset, at its birth. Now, I remember when I was a young player and the thought of owning a J45 just didn't really occur to me. Uh, but every time I would go to a guitar store and see a J45 there, I always felt like every one of them had their own soul to them. They all sounded a little bit different. Um, I would pick one up and it would play great. I'd pick another one up and I didn't really love it. And that's kind of the mystique that the J45 carries today. Now in 1970, Gibson really started to venture away from the traditional J45 shape and sound. They squared off the shoulders and they changed the bracing on the inside of the guitar. Now, this was significant because it made the guitar more sturdy, and so you didn't have as many cracks and breaks, but it also really kind of sucked up the sound, and you didn't have very resonant, um, very good sounding guitars. Now, in the mid 80s, Gibson was really on the brink of bankruptcy, and so they were purchased by another company that really sought to revitalize the brand. And this is where Gibson Acoustic takes an interesting turn. So, in the mid to late 1989, Gibson Acoustic opened their Bozeman, Montana shop. And those guitars that have come out of Bozeman are some of the, the best made and highest regarded Gibsons uh, to date. But this guitar predates those guitars a little bit. So this guitar was built in 1985 and it's a bit of an odd bird. So you can see that Gibson for this guitar has gone back to the round shoulder. It's not a square shoulder and it's single X braced. And so they started building these, I want to say 1985 and not many of them were made from 1985 to 1989 when Gibson moved their acoustic uh, workshop to Bozeman. I haven't been able to find production numbers on these and so I can't tell you exactly how many were made but just trying to find information on these mid to late 80s Gibsons is a little difficult. Now this guitar is uh, unique in a couple of ways. Um, I mentioned it's the mid to late 80s and not a lot of them have been found, uh, but it also has this really unique burst. And from what I can find, this is called an antique burst. It's, it's more aged, it's more um, almost like they were going for if you would find it in an antique mall or something that had been aged and antiqued for a long time. The last thing I wanna say about this guitar are the tuners. So these are tuners that you would find on a Hummingbird and not really tuners that you would find on a Gibson J45. Now, I would like to say that these are replacement tuners, but um, they have some weird things going on about them. On the, 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 the high strings, uh, you can see these extra hole marks for where they drilled what I'm assuming was a different, uh, a different tuner. But those hole marks aren't on the, low, the lowest three strings. And so it's kind of odd that you have these extra holes on the high E strings, but not on the low E strings. I'm not really sure what was going on there. Nevertheless, um, all the guitars that I have found from this era um, seem to have these tuners on them as well. So I don't know if it was a, a decision at the factory that they did that they had to change some of these, these necks. I, I'm not really sure.
Now I want to talk a little bit about why the J45 is such a unique guitar. It sits in this space that is very different than a lot of Martin guitars. So Martin guitars will have typically a really defined low end, um, a lot of projection, and a really defined high end. I gotta say that the J45 projects well, but it doesn't have a projection of a Martin typically. Uh, it doesn't have those really crisp low ends, but it kind of sits in this mid-range. And I think what it really does is it allows your voice to take the center stage, as opposed to the guitar taking the center stage. It, it kind of sits back and lets your voice be the focal point for what's going on. And I think that's why it's used in so many recording sessions is because it doesn't it doesn't take over the sound of where your voice should sit in a mix. Let me, let me show you what, what I mean. This is a Hank Williams song. This is I Can't Help It If I'm Still In Love With You. And notice how the guitar takes a back seat to my voice, but still adds the definition and fills out the tonal qualities of what a singer-songwriter would need. Today I passed you on the street and my heart fell at your feet I can't help it if I'm still in love with you It's hard to know somebody's lips will kiss you And on you like I used to do Heaven only knows how much I miss you I can't help it if I'm still in love with you As opposed to this now this is my 2016 Gibson Hummingbird Pro, and it has a couple differences. Uh, for one, it's square shoulder. Uh, it also has a longer scale length, uh, but the bracing is still similar. So I'm gonna play the same song, and I just want you to hear the difference between how this guitar fits with my voice, how that guitar fits with my voice, and kind of the differences and nuances that it brings out. Today I passed you on the street and my heart fell at your feet I can't help it if I'm still in love with you A picture from the past came slowly stealing As I brushed your arm and walked so close Suddenly I got that old time feeling I can't help it if I'm still in love with you So I think that song really highlights how the guitar is filling out a space but it's not taking up the same space that your voice takes up. And I think that's really unique in an acoustic guitar. I think that's why these are so popular. Okay, that's a really nitty gritty rundown of the Gibson J45, some of the tonal characteristics, and why this guitar has been used on stage and in a studio um, for well over 70 years. So tell me what you think. What's been your experience with the Gibson J45? Have you found one that you really love? Uh, has it helped you with your songwriting? Tell me what your thoughts are below. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Now let's talk about what I've been listening to this week. Okay, this week I've been listening to Adam Hood's Bad Days Better. This record is fantastic. Um, I think really Adam was going for this very like southern soulful kind of vibe with this record and I think he really nailed it. Uh, a couple of the tracks that really stood out to me are Flesh and B Blood. That song is just fantastic. It's a banger. Go listen to it. Uh, another one is um, Harder Stuff. That one is, is, a, is a great song. So check those songs out. Check out Adam Hood. Um, and uh, tell me what you think about Bad Days Better Below. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll see you soon. Peace.